some people that I've shared the gospel with, they said, man, Jesus coming to the world, it, it means nothing really. It was just like a divine timeout. 33 years for an eternal God. And I have to say, you fool, you're an idiot. You're an absolute moron to think that Jesus becoming a man was nothing. This is God. I mean, you and me wouldn't even want to go to a third world country for three weeks and live in a hut. Your air conditioning doesn't work and that's it. Where's God now? I'm being persecuted, right? Hey, brother, how about we fast this Holy Week? I don't know, man. I got to be on my diet. I need my 2,000 calorie intake at least every day. And here's God. I mean, we're talking about God coming into this dump. The holy, righteous God in whose presence angels prostrate fall. We sing this. In the old hymn books, that was the first song. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. That holy God became nothing. That he was manipulated by the hands of those he had created. Beaten, slapped, spat upon, stripped naked. Crucified on a cross. You talk about humility. You talk about meekness. In his investigation, Pilate says, so you are a king. And Jesus does not mince words. He says, yes, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. Oh, Pilate, you have no idea what kind of a king I am. If this was my kingdom, my servants would fight. But this is not my kingdom. This is nothing. This is a garbage dump that you guys are fighting over. Yes, I'm a king. You, you said rightly. But my kingdom is not of this world. We see the king of kings, and yet his meek, humble demeanor. There are many people these days who are very soft. Sorry, I don't mean to offend you, but we are very soft in our very comfortable, bubble-wrapped society that we live in. And we think that God should never get angry. God should always be this like peace, mildful, kind of like a Buddha kind of a figure that we've imagined him to be. But I want you to know that God gets violent when anything hinders his children from growing in intimacy with him. And I'm happy to have a God who's ready to get furious, who's ready to get violent, who's ready to go to war so that I can have intimacy with him, so that I can worship him. He doesn't stop at threats. He doesn't stop and say, well, you know what, man? Those things, I know it's, it's a little too big for me to handle. Man, he goes right into the thieves' den and he overturns tables. He goes right into the thick of it and he goes to war for who? Because we see very soon, verse 14, and the blind and the lame came to him, where? In the temple, and he healed them. This makes me want to jump for joy because I have a God who gets angry so that those who need healing aren't held back. Those who need salvation aren't held back. And I sometimes wonder if the Living Church Boise is alive today because God has been fighting on our behalf. If your homes are alive today because God has been fighting on your behalf, he says, I will not let anything stand in the way of you drawing close to me, Jesus.
You might know of Jesus. You might know everything I'm preaching. But maybe there's one thing you lack. The fruit that's in keeping with righteousness. The true evidence that you're born again. Walking in the joy and the power of the Holy Spirit. Where you daily experience His Spirit bearing witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. Don't make you coming to church a sign of your spirituality or your tithing a sign of your spirituality. Let the sign of your spirituality be how much you long for solitude in the holies of holies. A truly saved person will long to be alone with Jesus. Hey, good morning, everybody. Happy Resurrection Day. It is so good to see every one of you. Um, we're going to begin our time of, time of worship. Before we do so, I'm going to read this verse. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God.
You are powerful, and you are the only one who has the power to save. We worship you today, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for your word that's going to go out in a moment, Lord. I pray that it would be a powerful word, that it would find a place in, in good soil in our hearts, Lord, and bear good fruit. Come be glorified here today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Someone's excited to be at church. That's good. Yeah. Okay, before you sit down, take a quick minute and say hi to someone next to you.
Okay, I said take a quick minute. That wasn't very quick. No. Um, it's so nice to see the, the smiles and the joy in this room. And right after church, we have a few refreshments. So if you want to continue your conversations after church, you're welcome to do that. But I just want to say a quick welcome and good morning to everybody. And if this is your first time here, welcome. We're so glad that you're visiting with us today. If you have children ages three and under, we have childcare available. And it's not too late to check them in. Um, right outside these doors, if you hang a right, our children's ministry room is right there, so you can go take them over there. If you have older age kids visiting with you today or sitting with you, we really love families and encourage families to sit together and hear the word together. Um, I have five kids. I know it can be a little tricky, but um, even throughout the week, it's nice for us all to be hearing the same things so we can talk about the same things and grow together as a family. We have a living room. When you first came in, there's a coffee bar. Right before the coffee bar, there's a living room there where it's live streamed if you need that extra space with your older kids that are older than three, but not maybe quite old enough to sit still. So if you need that, um, that's available. Um, secondly, if you guys are part of Living Church and you're blessed by the church and you want to give, we have boxes um, for offering by the door. We also have online giving options. And I just want to take a quick minute and say hello to everybody who's joining us online this morning. Do you guys want to say hi to them? Good morning. Yeah. It's really beautiful to know that we have this church here in this building, but it actually goes outside of the walls of the church into the street corners where people are meeting, which it's not street corners anymore. It's everybody's on their phone. So um, we have, uh, yeah, that's how we do it. We, everyone's on their phones, on social media. So we try to go live as a church. We're on live right now on Facebook, YouTube, and even TikTok. So we have TikTok Church this morning. I think that's pretty cool. I'm excited by it to see the fruit and the contact we get from people to hear of the way that the word going out to their homes um, has changed their life. So with that being said, are you guys ready for the word? Yeah. Okay. I'm told that in America, it's tradition on Resurrection Sunday to say, He is risen. He is risen and the church responds with something. So let's try it. He's risen. He's risen. He's risen. Now, let me burst that bubble. All right. I'm going to jump right in. No dilly dallying. But first, welcome. I'm so glad that you're able to join us this morning. It's a very special Sunday. Um, there are very few Sundays that come close to a Sunday like this where you remember the power, the new life that we have because Jesus conquered sin and death. And I understand that seated in this room are believers who are fired up for Jesus. Can I get a whoop whoop? No, okay, good. And there are some of you who are weary, some of you who are tired of religion, you're tired of church, you're tired of slick preachers who at best can entertain you, and there's a fair chance that you've come to church every single year on Resurrection Sunday and left the same way you came. What's the point of celebrating a risen Savior? What's the point of remembering a man who lived and died and then allegedly is alive if we don't go back home changed, radically transformed? I'm here to wage war against the mediocre, against the lackadaisical, lazy river Christianity. And I want to just unleash the lion from the tribe of Judah and let him roar wild in his church this morning. Because I'm standing before you not because I'm a genius, not because I'm so smart, not because I have great eloquence. I stand before you today because I've experienced the power of the risen king. And I'm eager for each and every one of you to have not just what I experienced, but to have what the Bible calls us to experience. There's no point... 
in us talking about a risen Savior if we don't experience the power of the risen King and then take this life out into the dead world. And I want to preach this morning to bring some dead people to life and those who are alive to challenge you to live as those who have experienced and encountered the risen King. The Bible says we are the most of all to be pitied if Yeshua was not raised from the dead. And I'm here to tell you, He is alive. He is risen. If you're tired of religion, if you're tired of spirituality, if you're tired of orthodoxy, and you've tried, you've run from pillar to post, you run from religion to religion, you run from philosophies to philosophies, from various different historical traditions, but it just does not work, I want to invite you to give your life to Jesus, because there's only one who's alive, and his name is Jesus. Religion will die. Philosophies will die. Thoughts and ideologies will fade away. Cultures will eventually be overturned and replaced. But there's one, like we sang, who is king of kings forever and eternally, and his name is Jesus. But if you're feeling weary, if you're worried this morning, if you found yourself in your own grave... And you mustered up the courage to come to church or you're joining online because you just did not have enough strength to be around Christians with a smile saying, He is risen. And you're tired. You're not replying to your mother-in-law's text message because you're like, mm, I can't put up with this anymore. <laughs> Melinda, that was not a shot against you. <laughs> if you're we weary and if you're worried, uh, I want to encourage you. You're not alone. You're not alone at all. In fact... The disciples of Jesus, his very close friends, even they were weary. They were worried. They were troubled, sick on resurrection morning. But something radically changed. And maybe that change will happen to you. The disciples are locked behind a closed door. And the women muster up the courage to carry their weary, worried feet to that tomb early in the morning as it's getting bright. And every single year I read this, my heart just, it breaks, man. Jesus, the only person in their life that's given them a sense of dignity, a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, and he's brutally murdered and killed, put away in a tomb. And although they want to go and be as close to him as possible, even if it's just his lifeless body, they have to wait for the Sabbath to end. And you can imagine the eager waiting. And early morning, the Bible says, the little weary, worried feet begin to make their way to that tomb, hoping to find a dead Jesus and hoping to find a big stone against the tomb. And instead, what they encounter is something that radically transforms and changes their lives. What I want to talk to you about this Resurrection Sunday morning are the three words that jumped out at me. Three words. It's not even Jesus' words. It's what the angel tells the women as they're running to the tomb in their own worried and weary state. There are three words for the weary heart. That's the title for this morning's message, three words for the weary heart. Now, I would love to stand here for an hour and be excited about the risen Savior and show you what the Apostle Paul writes and what the Apostle Peter did and what the Apostle John writes about the resurrection. And I would love to, to dive into that, but... I believe what the Holy Spirit wants me to preach on this morning is for those of you who are nursing your worry. You're trying to somehow energize yourself in your weary state and you're doing the best you can to roll that stone away in your own eager self. Like these women, they, they're all there and they're saying, you know what, I do not know how we're going to roll the stone away, but we'll figure it out when we get there. You ever been there where... The numbers don't line up. Your budget doesn't line up. Your health, your strength, your age, it doesn't line up. But you say, you know what? Let's put our best foot forward. We'll figure it out when we get there. And many of us, are, that's become our life. 
were figuring it out day by day, trying to roll the stone away as much as you can, putting your back into it, and you got to go see a chiropractor. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you that Jesus is alive. He's already rolled the stone away. And the three words that changes these women's everything, their emotions, their understanding, their spirituality, is something that I want us as a church to experience so that it takes us from a place of worry, a place of being weary, to being warriors who worship. You ready for that? Yeah. We're going to be in the book of Matthew chapter 28. I'm going to be reading the first 10 verses, but I'm really going to be focusing on two verses. But Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 10. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If you don't, the scripture will be up on the screen, and it's our tradition in the Living Church Boise for us to stand at the reading of God's Word. I'm going to invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. We stand because we have reverence for God's Word. And as you will see this morning, man's opinions will not take you from your weary, worried self to a warrior who's ready to worship. It's only the Word of God, the truth of God through the Spirit of God that will illuminate our path our ways, our purpose, and find ourselves in the hands of the risen King. So let's read the Word of God. Matthew chapter 28, picking up from verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the gods trembled and became like dead men. But the angels said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. Now pay attention to the next two verses. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said, Come, see the place where he lay, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he's gone. He's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. That's exceedingly great joy. The joy is so great that they're trembling. Beautiful joy. And they ran to tell the disciples, and behold, Jesus met them and said, uh, bad translation. It says, greetings. Can you imagine Jesus being like, greetings, cheerio, hail, <laughs> shalom, peace. He greeted them. Shalom, peace be unto you. And they came, and they came up and took hold of his feet, and they worshipped him. And they worshipped him. And they worshipped him. They go from being worried, weary, to worship. That is a transformation that is beautiful. Doctors cannot do that. Money cannot do that. But only Jesus and his word can do that. Verse 10. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the word of God. Three things I want to try to bring out from this that will transform your life help you experience the power of the risen king. The first thing we're going to see is the invitation to come. Second, the investigation to see. And third, the impartation to go and tell. The invitation come. Then the invitation goes even beyond that to investigate. And then the impartation where you actually are able to receive the power of the risen king now to be his mouthpiece, to be his hand, and to be his feet that transfers the world from the world of darkness into the kingdom of light. This is a word for those who are worried, for those who are weary to transform us into warriors who are ready to worship the king. Let's pray and we'll get to work. Father, I pray that this morning you will speak to us, O oh Lord. We are eager to recognize our own graves and we're excited to come out of our graves with you, Jesus, hand in hand, step by step, Every step of the way, Savior, like a gentle shepherd, lead us now and bring us out of the grave, O oh Lord. I pray that the dead will be raised to life this morning. I pray that the deaf will be able to hear, the blind will be able to see, and those who are lost will be able to say, I am found in Him. I thank you now for what you're going to do, O oh Lord. Let this morning be 
the most powerful morning we've ever experienced in church. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Please be seated and get comfortable, and we'll unpack the Word of God. The first message for the weary women, but it's not limited just to the women, but the first message, the first word for the weary is the invitation, the invitation to come. The gospel highlights various women, now with the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they highlight various different women that make their way to the tomb resurrection Sunday morning. Matthew 2, that we just read, speaks of Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Mark 16, verse 1, mentions three women. Luke 24 adds that there were other women. And John just mentions one, Mary Magdalene. It's not a discrepancy. It's because the gospel writers are trying to focus on the point that they're trying to make. Whenever you read the gospels and you see that things are a little different, it's because they are trying to get to the point that they're trying to make. And they're writing it from their perspective. But all the four gospels talk about the women in their weary and worried state are making their way to the cross. Let's look at Mark real quick. Mark chapter 16 verse 2 says this. And it says, And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, that's the S-U-N, had come up, they went to the tomb. I don't want you all getting excited. Be like, woohoo, yeah. You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> slow down. Different spelling. Anyways, and when... And, and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Like I said earlier, these are women who are on the move, on a mission, but do not know how they're actually going to be able to get to Jesus. There's a barrier between them. And they are walking towards the tomb worried, not knowing. And I know that every single one of you over here there's an area in your life where there's a, st a stone blocking you from being able to experience all that God has for you. Maybe in your marriage, in your personal life, in your parenting, in your finances, in your own personal struggles with temptations that easily drag you down. And you say, and your church today saying, I will get here and we will see what we could do. And I'm so glad you're here because God has a plan and this was his plan. Matthew chapter 28, verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. I'm so sorry for those of you who heard me preach multiple Resurrection Sunday morning services, and you've heard me every single time when I talk about this angel, I say, I think this angel's name was Fonzie. It's like, one, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock, hey. And the stone just rolls away, and he sits on it cool-like, you know. <laughs> Those of you who are younger, happy days, watch it. Um, I was very influenced by the Fonz. So a lot of times in the Bible, I'm like, that sounds like Fonzie. But check this out, verse 3. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow, dazzling. And for the fear of him, the gods trembled and became like dead men. I'm telling you, man, I see a lot of similarities, except for the white dazzling, right? Not the black leather jackets, but you get it. The soldiers at this point are way more worried than the women are. Isn't that crazy? Because the women are going to the tomb worried about, man, who's going to roll the stone away? And the soldiers who are guarding the, the, the tomb, they're fallen down as dead men. They're not dead, but they look. They're stiff. Frozen. But the angel, this is what the angel tells the women, verse 5, do not be afraid. Isn't that beautiful that when you're on God's side, you don't have to be afraid? Amen. Even right now, let the worry, let the weariness begin to fall down as dead in your life because when you're on the Lord's side, you don't have to fear whenever the glory of God is being revealed because the glory of God is not there to kill you. The glory of God is there to invite you. Look at this. Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. And then, this is the first word that we see that encourages the weary woman. Come, see the place where he lay. The first word of encouragement for the worried hearts is he is risen, but it doesn't stop there. But they're invited to come on in. Come on in. 
Come see for yourself. I'm so glad that Jesus didn't, you know, overcome sin and death. And then he's like, whew, so glad that's done. Peace out. I'm out of here. <laughs> Time for some heavenly tacos. Let's go. You know, I mean, if you and I were God, I think that's what we would do. We'd be like, whew, can't wait to get off this plane. Been on a long plane ride? Can't wait to get off this plane, man. I mean, Jesus was worse than a long plane ride, right? He's like, whew, this is done, 33 years, being abused, spat upon. Praise the Lord. I'm out of here. Instead, we see Jesus as a God who has this language in everything that he said. He's a God who invites you to come and do life with him. I want you to get this because this side of the world, and I'm, I'm, I, I don't mean hate. I'm not being bitter, okay? Okay? I'm not being bitter. I want you to get this, though. Here, we have so many churches that invite you to the Easter Sunday celebrations. My wife and I, we stopped watching our favorite television shows, and we were watching ads on Instagram with all the churches and seeing all the various ways they invite people to church. Come join us. We have 10,000 Easter eggs for your kiddos. We have this fantastic bounce house. We have photo booths for your family. So even though you're ugly, we'll make you look good. We got filters for that. We've got an amazing, you know, spread of food and lunch and snacks and come dressed in your best and we've got an amazing band that's going to play we've got 51 services and we'll pack the place up and all that we do is we respond to an invitation to a stupid building and we miss the invitation to Jesus to the empty tomb no wonder we go back home weary worried and want to kill yourself Easter eggs don't save you. Jesus does. A music team does not save you. Jesus does. A stupid photo booth and a picture on your wall does not bring your broken family together. Only Jesus does. And he's inviting you to come and see for yourself that he is no longer dead. He's risen. There's got to be an urgency. Because... Small, little, easily ignored invitations from the Holy Ghost will quickly turn to bitter, arrogant disobedience towards the Holy Spirit. I love you, church. I, I think sometimes I wonder why in the world did God bring me to this country? I was telling this to my friends when I was having breakfast with them last week. I said, sometimes it feels like what I'm doing over here seems like a drop, not even a drop in the bucket. It's not even bringing any sort of moisture to the dry, dead religion that we love to embrace in this side of the world. Are you with me this morning? Because if we say, if we say that I serve a God who overcame death, who overcame sin, and the word of God says the same power that raised Jesus from the dead resides in me, I, I, I got to lose my mind, man. I mean, if, if this is a reality, that the same power that Pow! Raised Jesus from the dead. Now to all the haters who say that, well, he was just in a swoon. And he got up and he rolled a stone away. And he went to the disciples. I'm so sorry. I love you. I have some level of respect for you. But not for such kind of ideologies. A man who's beaten it to pulp, who's been stabbed in the side, cannot just walk out. He was raised to life. And not just that, he didn't run away as a victorious hero, neither did he hide as a coward, but he invites every single one of you, come, 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 come. In fact, for the weary, look at your invitation from Jesus. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, he says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This was, this was Jesus' language, man. This is, what, this is how he spoke. 
He never said, leave me alone, back off. Excuse me, can you please get these stinking children off my lap? No, he said, come, come. Peter's in the boat, and he sees Yeshua walking on the water, and he says, Lord, if that's you, bid me to come. And Jesus doesn't say, are you serious, man? Are you stupid? No, he says, We have a God who invites you, not just inviting you from your weariness to worship, but he also invites you to purpose. Jesus, he's walking along the beach, and he looks at Peter and his brother Andrew, Mark chapter 1, verse 17, and Jesus said to them, come, come, just follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Come. How many times, man? We try to find out how we fit into the world. How do we fit into life? How do I fit into society? How do I fit into my neighborhood? How do I fit as a Californian in Idaho? <laughs> Maybe I'll drive a big truck. You know? How do I fit in as an Indian in America? We're trying to fit in. And Jesus says, you want to find your purpose in life? You first got to come to me. Amen. Not just for the weary, not just for purpose, but he also invites you to fellowship with him. You feel alone? You feel misunderstood? You ever woken up and you wonder why in the world you're still alive? I should be dead. I don't belong over here. Nobody understands me. Well, Jesus does, and that's all that matters, because if the whole world understood you and Jesus didn't, man, there's no point in you living. But Jesus invites you to fellowship. Jesus, he's raised again from the dead, and it's a beautiful passage in John chapter 21. He performs a miracle. The disciples catch fish. And then he chills out with them, man. He has breakfast with them. I mean, barbecued fish for breakfast. John 21 verse 12. He invites you to fellowship. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Come and have breakfast. And I believe this morning, Jesus is inviting you to his table. He says, come. I have room for you. No matter who you are, Come. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Come. Yeah. No matter what you've done, come. No matter how much you've denied me, come. No matter how much you betrayed me, come. No matter how much you've doubted me, come along. Come along. I'm inviting you. And this invitation is not just something that was limited to three years of Jesus' ministry. It's not just limited to when the pastor preaches on a resurrection Sunday. This invitation for you to come to Jesus is an eternal invitation. Eternal invitation. Look at this. Revelation chapter 22 verse 17 says, The spirit and the bride say, come. The bride is the church. This morning the church is inviting you who are weary, who are worried, who are dead in your religion, dead in your good works, dead in the world, dead in your small group trying to figure out where you fit in. Jesus is inviting you and saying, come. And let the one who hears say, come, that's your response. Say, I'm coming, Lord Jesus, I want you. I'm responding to your invitation. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. This is an invitation from both the Spirit and the church. For anyone who hears to respond to the invitation that Jesus is offering you. And for you to put your hand on that gospel plow, man. Put your hand on the eternal life he's calling you to. For those who are spiritually thirsty, come to Jesus and drink of the water that he freely gives. His living water, spirit, that will never run dry, symbolizing the freedom of the gracious gift that we have in Jesus. Jesus is telling us not to be bystanders. Can you imagine the women if they went to the tomb and they see... The soldiers are falling on his dead. We have Fonzie on the rock, you know, <laughs> rocking around the clock. And, and, you, and they hear the invitation to come. And if they just stand there and say, well, this was great. This, this is good enough. This is enough. I saw an angel. I saw some cool stuff. I'm going to go back. And they never responded to the invitation. That would be stupid. You cannot even imagine that. You cannot picture that. But yet, there are many of us who come to church every year for Resurrection Sunday, and we participate as bystanders. We watch from afar. And this morning, this year, I want to invite you 
to not be a bystander, but to participate by responding to the invitation. And not just that, we don't just have to stand as bystanders, we get to respond, but look at how much you get to respond. Number two, come and investigate, the investigation, see. So first we see the invitation, and secondly, we see the investigation, see. You know, lies do not like to be investigated. Do you know that? If you have children, you wouldn't even doubt the statement. <laughs> See, all the, all the dads are laughing. They're like, uh-huh, <laughs> you know? Because the minute you start pushing back, you start an investigation. Hey, how'd you get that on your hand? Is that a Sharpie? <laughs> Where did you get the Sharpie from? Nowhere. <laughs> wow, it just magically appeared in your hand, huh? And left a mark. Wow, actually, wait a minute. That's not Sharpie. That's grease. You've been fiddling with my motorcycle. That's even worse than a Sharpie, right? Lies don't like to be investigated. Truth, however, loves to be investigated. Truth loves to be investigated, to be scrutinized, to be put under the magnifying glass. And I want you to know that the Bible has been scrutinized for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And you can find, every single year, you'll find articles written to disprove the Bible. Because today, in today's world with social media, opinion is cheap. Right? Everybody has it, man. Opinion is cheap. But if you were to spend time to actually look into the claims of Scripture, if you were to look into how much it has been scrutinized, in fact, this is the only book in existence that has been scrutinized to the point at which it has been. And every single time, it proves itself to be true. Because God has protected his word for you and me to get it. So that you and I can respond to the invitation. And not just respond to the invitation, but for us also to begin to examine it. To investigate it. The reason why I want to stress on this is because, track with me please. Christianity is not a philosophy. Okay? Christianity is not a philosophy. Although it does have... What philosophy has, it, it talks about morality, it talks about metaphysics, it talks about wisdom and knowledge. We're going through a series in the book of Proverbs, and that's kind of what we're talking about. Although it has what philosophy addresses, Christianity is more than a philosophy. Buddhism is a philosophy. Why is Christianity more than a philosophy? Because philosophy does not have a God in it, okay? Philosophy is non-theistic. Philosophy does not have a deity in it, but Christianity does. So when we're called to investigate the claims of the risen Savior, what you're being invited to is not just to have blind faith. It's not for you to memorize formulas, it's not for you to memorize what you should do on the Sabbath, what you should do on Wednesday, what you should do on Resurrection Sunday, wh how, what you should eat and not eat on a Friday. What you're called to is to examine and to investigate a real person named Jesus so that you can have a real relationship with Him. Every other religion falls short in this regard because at best they are a philosophy. They will teach you dogmas and formulas. Am I, am I going over your head for this morning? I hope not. Because America needs to hear this, man. Because in America, even in the church, we become very philosophical. We want tickling ears. You remember what the Bible talks about? That's the American church. Ooh, that was great. My pastor said that Christianity is not a philosophy. It is because it has theos, God in it. It's got to get beyond your head and understand that the invitation is to have a personal relationship with God, not just a wide, big-headed understanding of what the Bible says. Come and see. The Greek word there for see is not just Stand there by, like a tourist. You ever been to touristy places where you got people with cameras? I'm not going to mention the race, but they always got cameras. And they're clicking away. 
I'm like, what are you going to do with all those pictures, man? Like, dude, like, it's insane. But you're clicking away, and then they go back home, but they don't have a personal relationship with the king that lived in the palace, with the person that built that building. They don't have a personal relationship. All they have is some touristy pictures. And many of us, we come to church like tourists. We, sure, I will respond to the invitation, I will come. But the best part is going to be the photo booth before I leave church. And we leave with pictures. The word here, to come and to see, is a word that says, come investigate. Or to put it in a very common language, we say, check it out, man. <laughs> check it out. You know, when you buy a new car and you're showing off, I'm young still, so that's what I do. You know, I show off, and I'm like, man, so much faster than yours, no way. Bro, check it out. I'm not telling him, take a picture. I'm telling him, get in the driver's seat, man. <laughs> vroom, vroom. You hear that? <laughs> Blow off valve. Yes. <laughs> Squeal the tires. I, I got to get people to understand. <laughs> Hands on. Not just see with the eye, but investigate. Get into it. Or you come to my home and there's good Indian food, right? And you're like, mmm, smells good. I'm like, dude, check it out. <laughs> Taste it. And isn't that what the Holy Communion is all about? To touch, to feel, to taste. It's supposed to be a picture of us investigating, tearing apart all the claims of Jesus, not because we're trying to disprove something, but because we see that it's the truth and we want to have a personal grasp on it. You know, one of the worst things that I've heard as a pastor is when Christians just regurgitate stuff that they heard. Can't stand those Christians, man. Because you know that it's, it's not coming from the heart. Out of the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks the word of God says. But for many of us, the other verse is tr proven to be true. It says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. We don't have love for Jesus. We don't investigate his claims, but we want to grow in knowledge, and you're just puffing away. And no wonder people run when you start quoting verses. They're like, mm, stay away. He's on a Bible trip now. Right? Because Jesus is more than a philosophy. He calls us to investigate because he's a God who wants to have a personal relationship with you. Let's look at scripture. Matthew 21, verse 6. It says, he's not here, for he is risen. As he said, come and then see the place where he lay. Come see where he lay. Come check it out. You get it now, right? See, you get it. Come, touch, feel, watch, look. Take a good note of it. The cloth is folded, put away. His head was there. His feet is here. But now angels are sitting here because now this is the meeting place where God can meet, where man can meet God through the death and resurrection of Jesus. To see is not just an invitation to come and take pictures. It's not just for you to be like, huh, that was good. But the invitation is for you to become a scholar, for you to become an investigator, for you to be determined to find the truth. For you to go through scripture like a judge, of a good judge, who's looking to identify that treasure that God has for you. The Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You got to investigate Jesus like your life depended on it because all of your eternity depends on it. See the place where he lay. This invitation to come investigate, I believe, points out three realities in our Christian faith that many of us as Christians have not taken advantage of, and that's why we find ourselves weary and worried. Three advantages that we overlook because we don't investigate the claims of Jesus. Subpoints for my second point. The first blessing that we forfeit is you're invited to do a personal investigation of the gospel. A personal investigation of the gospel. Now, maybe you don't realize this, but like I said earlier, God is true and he's not frightened of your investigation. I've been kicked out of churches because I asked questions. And I'm so glad I was kicked out of churches because it forced me to go investigate for myself. And that was my Bible college. People ask me, where do you get your content to preach every week? Because if you go and look at commentaries, I'm not just pulling stuff from commentaries. Next week you come back, we're going to jump back into the book of Proverbs. And it's a crazy book. 
Where do you get it from? It's because I investigate. I throw my hardest questions at the Word of God. And I don't stop until I find answers that completely make sense, that reflect the truth in which I'm supposed to be living. But we're living in a very comfortable world where you can just Google any question, or you can go on the internet and find any question. There are so many resources that we tend to get lazy in growing in personal intimacy with Jesus. If I didn't personally investigate relationships in my life, and if I was just on social media trying to find out more about them, I wouldn't be able to have a personal relationship with that person. If I want to grow in a personal relationship with someone, i got to spend time with them, talk to them. Ask them open-ended questions and closed-ended questions and see what they answer. And I follow up questions. And maybe some of you are like, man, I'm scared to ask God questions. Don't be, man. Don't be. God is not offended by your questions. Jesus, as he starts off his ministry, he finds one of his disciples named Philip. And then Philip he goes and finds Nathanael. It says in John chapter 1, verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He's saying, We found the Messiah. Philip is so excited. He's telling Nathanael, We found the Messiah. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> you got to understand, it's like how many of you are looking at news right now and saying, Can anything good come out of Hollywood? Really? <laughs> oh. I mean, I'm deleting all my old music, and I'm like, man, this is just garbage, man. This is horrible. All the nonsense that comes out of it. And I want you to get it that when Philip is saying, like, we found the Messiah from Nazareth, Nathaniel is like, dude, nothing good comes out of Nazareth, man. Like, he means it. And look at Philip's response. Philip said to him, come and see. How about I invite you, come, and how about you come and investigate? You investigate for yourself. And I'm telling you, God is not frightened of your investigation because truth is not frightened when it's put under the magnifying glass. I think the second blessing that we forfeit because we don't investigate the claims of Jesus is we forfeit the ability to critically think about the gospel, to critically engage with the gospel. Because you see, this, what these words say in the Bible, just doesn't point us towards morality. It points us towards wisdom. Okay? Wisdom is you deciding and knowing when to do something, even if it's not plainly stated, if it's right or wrong. The book of Proverbs is all about that. When we don't investigate the word of God, when we don't investigate the claims of Jesus, when we don't investigate the gospel, we forfeit the joy of growing in critical thinking. Jesus, he meets two disciples, not one of his 12. There were, Jesus had many disciples. He, he meets two of these disciples, it says, on the road to Emmaus, on the day of his resurrection. And these two disciples, they were very sorrowful. They were very sad. And they're on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus shows up to them, and he does not say, man, I'm so blessed that you guys are feeling so sorrowful about my death. Oh, my gosh. It's so great. I feel so loved. Some of the men are just rolling their eyes being like, bro, enough, get on. I know. Move on. But hey, listen, that's kind of what we want from our pastors. That's kind of what you want from your leaders. I'm like, you're great, girl. You go, girl. You're awesome. Jesus, look at Jesus' response. I like Jesus' response better. Luke 24, 25. And he said to them, check it out. Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe. <laughs> you idiot. What's wrong with you? You should have been investigating what Scripture says and what's happening. You should be critically thinking through what's going on. Come on, I raised the dead. I walked on water. I multiplied food. I opened the eyes of those who were born blind. And you're walking sorrowful when you should be critically thinking. Church, I want you to wake up this morning because we are supposed to be people who have wisdom. Not regurgitating dead old religious words. We're supposed to be walking as critical thinkers. As people who are able to discern what's happening in our world around us. Not frightened by every news and by every darkness that's being unearthed. Oh foolish ones and slow of heart to believe. 
all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, look at this, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He's teaching them scripture and teaching them to critically think through it so that they can come to a place of understanding. And I wonder if you are struggling in your worry, if you're struggling in your own fear, you're struggling in your weariness of the world, because you don't understand the treasure that you're sitting on, the treasure you have with the invitation to come and then to investigate. Sometimes you look at people and you wonder how in the world do that how in the world does that person exist? How are you able to survive? You look at people and you say, man, you should be dead by now. And if you were the present, you would find out that they are investigating the promises of God, the word of God, and they're applying it, and it's giving them strength. Investigation doesn't stop at just coming to church, singing a few songs, but then opening the word in your own personal life, engaging the mind, testing your heart, examining the power of Jesus and his resurrection, and to see if it's showing up in your life. The gospel writers, they encourage us to look at this, to test everything. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19 says, Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Test everything. I think a third blessing that we forfeit because we don't examine, investigate Jesus, is we fail to have a transparent relationship with Jesus. We fail to have this, this personal relationship with Jesus where you're able to talk to Him, where you're able to be yourself with Him. Oftentimes in our own relationships in the world, you can go through those times where you feel like you got to bite your tongue, walk on eggshells, if you don't know what that feels like, talk to my wife. All right? I'm joking. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You'd be like, man, if he's so intense when he preaches, I wonder what he's like at home. I'm silent, man. I save up for this. <laughs> but you know, sometimes in our relationships, you got to feel like, oh, tread carefully. Or you go to work and you're like, okay, I don't know what version of my boss I'm going to get. Hmm? Watch out. Well, Jesus is not so. You can talk to him openly. You can talk to him freely. Again, talking to my friends just two weeks ago, it's surprising how many Christians feel like when they come to God, they got to, I don't know if you use the term over here in America, butter him up, you know, like boost his ego. Oh, Lord, you're so awesome, holy and mighty king, and stop with the King James, man. <laughs> Talk to him honestly. Talk to him genuinely. Lord, I'm tired, Lord. Lord, I don't want to be alive anymore, Lord. God, I feel stupid right now, God. God, I completely blew it, Lord. God, I'm angry. God, I've been praying for so long, and you've been silent, Lord. I mean, if you want to grow in authenticity and talking to him, read some of the Psalms and watch how authentic David gets before God. And the Word of God says that David was a man after God's own heart. Man, if you want to be a man of God's own heart, receive the invitation. Come, but don't just be a tourist when you come, but investigate his claims, examine his claims, talk to him honestly, talk to him openly, engage in critically thinking through his Word investigate the claims of Jesus. One of Jesus' disciples, Thomas, he wasn't there when Jesus showed up to the other disciples. And for eight long days, the disciples tried to convince Thomas that Jesus is alive. Eight days, man. I mean, these guys were best friends. And I think I can convince my friends of anything. You know, I mean, when you're friends, you believe everything a person says, right? I remember once, it was a bad joke, but this girl in my youth group, I convinced her that I was an alien. I mean, in America, people will believe that, but I was in India. I look just like them, you know? I'm just like, really? Like, yeah, nanu, nanu. You know? <laughs> Friends believe anything, but Thomas was not ready to believe them. Jesus alive? No way, bro. No, at eight days, he's with them. He's like, no way. John 20, verse 26, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. That was the greeting. Shalom. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it on my side. And then he says, Do not disbelieve, but believe. 
And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. What's the point in this? Be transparent about where you stand with Jesus. This morning, if you've been faking it as a Christian, be transparent before God and say, Lord, I want to believe, but please help my unbelief. God can handle it, man, because I would rather have a church of Judas, uh, not Judas, Thomas's, Judas, we would, yeah, you know. <laughs> Don't be coming near me with that kiss. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I would rather have a church of Thomas's, if you're Judas, you're welcome, God will save you, of Thomas's who are willing to be real with the unbelief because Jesus can handle it and he's willing to show up to real authentic people. Like I've said many times, God will not bless who you pretend to be, but he wants to talk to you because he knows you. Philosophy has formulas. Religion has rules. Jesus invites you to a relationship. Amen. So he's calling you to respond. Did invitation come? Don't be a bystander. He's inviting you to reason, to investigate, not just to be a tourist taking pictures. And finally... Now, when you've responded to the invitation, you begin to examine his claims, and now he calls you, and he says, I want you to be my mouthpiece. I want you to be my hands and my feet. Number three, the impartation to go and tell. I started off this message by telling you that the Bible says that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us, okay? And there have been too many denominations and movements that have tried to prove that the power of the risen Christ lives in us by trying to pray for healing and prophecy. And I'm not against that, okay? I believe the Holy Spirit is still alive and active like He was in the early church. However, this impartation that God is giving us to go and to tell, the impartation to be His mouthpiece, does not come by some crazy fancy stuff that happens in your body or in your mind, Okay? I'll tell you this morning how you know for certain if you have the power of the risen king in you or not. We started off with those who are weary and are worried. Like the women. They were weary, they are worried, they're running to the tomb. And now, I believe, they're running twice as fast back with the message and the good news. They're running twice as fast back to men who are disciples who are not going to believe the women's word. That, that's how the culture was. But did it stop them from running back with the message? It did not, just in case you did not know. It didn't stop them from running back with joy and excitement. How did they change from being worried and weary to being worshipful warriors who are running with the message? It's because the power of the risen king is working in them. And I'm telling you that once you've experienced, you've investigated, you've responded to the invitation, there is a joy, a strength. The Word of God says the joy of the Lord is your strength. Worry is gone. Weariness is gone because you find yourself participating in a purpose that's much bigger than you. You might be thinking that, hey, weary people need a break, not a mission to go and tell. Weary people need, you know... Time off, man. Weary people need a nap. Weary people need caffeine. Weary people need a vacation. You know what weary people need? Thank you. Good. Weary people need Jesus. People who are burnt out need Jesus. People who have been betrayed need Jesus. People whose hope has come to a screeching halt, what you need is Jesus. What you need is not in your house. What you need is not in your relationship. What you need is not in your job. What you need is not in your church. What you need is Jesus. And from Him... All blessings floor. From Him, everything else will fall into place. It's from Him that we move and live and have our being. Matthew 28, verse 7, the angel tells the women, Then go quickly and tell His disciples that He has risen from the dead. And behold, He is going before you to Galilee. There you will see Him. See, I have told you. Quick question. Have these women seen Jesus yet in Matthew? In our, no, they've not seen Jesus yet. Track with me. They've not seen Jesus yet. According to Matthew's narrative, they've not seen Jesus yet. But the angel is telling them to go quickly and to tell the disciples that he's risen. Is it because they haven't investigated the claim enough? No, they saw the empty tomb. 
They saw that the napkin, his body, is fold, the, the cloth that was wrapped around him is folded, put away. They see the angels fall on his dead. They see the tombstone roll away. They're talking to an angel. And they're running back in haste. They're not saying, well, let's see Jesus first, and then I will believe. And I want you to know this. Faith is not blind. Faith investigates. But faith trusts what we see now in part, knowing that as we walk in faith, God will reveal to us more and more and more and more and more. And that's another invitation I want to give to some of you who have been waiting to see the full picture, but you're not responding on what God has already shown you. He's already shown you that you're weary, that you're worried. He's already shown you that he's inviting you to a new life. He's already shown you that he's your friend and your God who's okay to be investigated. He says, check it out. Come and see. But if you don't respond to this first, then you will not have the joy and the power of the risen king living in you, man. Here's something that you might want to write down. There is no proclamation. There is no power without first the fascination, without first the interest and the passion that captivates you about Jesus. You see, I wasn't a fired up preacher when I was a newborn believer, but I was fired up for his word. And then from there, he began to show me his power. I wasn't just a person who was walking around and sharing the gospel with people, telling people about Jesus. But as I began to walk with him, Every day responding to the invitation. Every day investigating his claims. And then more and more and more and more. The fascination for Jesus began to grow that turned into an automatic proclamation. And as I begin to proclaim Jesus, I begin to experience the power of the risen king in me. As I begin to open my mouth and speak, as I begin to pray for people, as I begin to talk to people about what God did for me, I begin to experience the power of the risen king. I go back home, my family says like, gosh, what happened to Joel? I don't remember him being this way growing up. And it's one of the best things to hear my dad and mom say, like, man, I don't recognize this too well. What happens as you respond to the invitation, as you engage in critical reasoning, investigating the claims, you begin to experience the impartation of what God is calling you to do. Many of you have lost purpose in life, and God is calling you to stop trying to roll the stone away yourself. You will get weary. You will be worried, but respond to the invitation. Say, Lord, I need you. And Lord, I'm ready to have a personal relationship with you, honest, transparent one, where I want to critically start thinking about your word. And even everything this man is preaching about, I want to go back home and I want to investigate its claims so that I will be able to experience the power of the risen king because, Lord, I, I want to be able to grasp all that you have for me. Peter and John, they hear the women. The women come back, and I can only imagine. I don't know why women do this when they tell a story. And then, and then, and then, and I'm not trying to be, you know, hating on women or anything like that. It's just a fact, guys, okay? I love you all, but it's a fact. So I tell my wife, I said, okay, I don't need a trip to, to Japan and back. Get to the point. Get to the point. And some of you are like, Pastor, I wish you'd preach more like that. I know, I know, I know. It's kind of crazy. But, and I wonder if Peter and John were like, did the soldiers, did they, did they harass you? What happened? Did you roll the stone away? No, no, no. Let me get to the point. Okay, anyways. Now, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, Luke 24, verse 10. And the other women with them who told these things to the apostles, that they saw the empty tomb, the angel was there, verse 11. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. I am so sorry. They're like, whatever. Did not believe them. It's kind of crazy. It's, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking when you put yourself in their shoes you know you're like i am so wow my world has been turned upside down guys we were weeping and going there with a stone and we did not know what to do but jesus is alive what i'm telling you he is risen and it's silence no he's risen indeed and disciples are like excuse me what's wrong with you they did not believe them but look at this look at this but peter rose and ran to the tomb. He is coming to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. He is investigating. You with me? And he went home marveling at what had happened. Yeesh, this is good. I can stand here and preach like the women. 
I can be excited. I can tell you of eyewitness accounts of my own life, of how I've seen Jesus come alive. But my friend, you have got to make, it, make a beeline to the tomb. You've got to make your way to the cross. You've got to go, and you have got to respond to the invitation, investigate, and only then will you have the impartation of the power of the risen king where you can leave marveling at what had happened. And once again, Peter had not seen Jesus yet, but yet he sees God's handiwork. And you know what? You and I have not seen Jesus. And there are people who fool you and say, I saw Jesus. He was on a taco. He was on a tortilla. I've been talking about tacos a lot. I don't know why. Do you remember it was on Facebook all over for a couple of years, Jesus' face on a toast? Like that Jesus' is toast. But, you know, you and I have not seen Jesus. We've not seen his face. We've not seen his nail-scarred hands. We've not been there to see the empty tomb. We've not stood on Golgotha where Jesus was killed and crucified. We've not seen him. And yet we see in his word what it says, and we see the power and the spirit of God bringing things to life. We've seen him transform our lives. We're investigating the claims. And just like the women who did not see Jesus yet, but they're taking the word of God that's spoken through the angel, that's spoken through prophecy, that's spoken through scripture. Peter, although he doesn't believe the pastors or the women, he runs for himself and he investigates it, even though he hasn't seen Jesus yet. He goes back marveling. He's not going back worried. He's not going back sad. But he goes back marveling at what happens. And you and I, we cannot leave saying, well, I went to church, but tch, looks like Jesus didn't want to show up. Because all I saw was a brown guy, no blonde hair, blue eyes, Jesus. <laughs> right? One day you will see him face to face. Amen. And you will fall on your face. Amen. But in the meantime, in the meantime, he's calling us, Come. He's encouraging us, investigate, draw closer to me. You're not going to get closer to Jesus just by listening to a sermon every Sunday, but it's got to be investigated in such a point where it's now changing who you are. And you begin to experience the power of the risen king because when you begin to experience your worry and your weariness turn to authentic worship, there's a fascination with Jesus that you cannot shut up about, and then there's a proclamation, you begin to see that, wow, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead does reside in me, and He is working in me, and He's working through me. If you're a believer, I want to ask you, if you have a testimony, I'm not talking about what happened 30 years ago. I'm talking about a fresh testimony of, hey, this is what God is doing in my life right now. This is what He's teaching me right now. This is what He's scrubbing away from my life right now. I'm so glad you have a testimony from 1983, but let's get a testimony from 2024 also of how the risen Lord is still alive in your life, is still active in your life, is still transforming your life, is still sanctifying your life as you examine His claims and as you respond to it. And then you begin to speak that to people. You begin to share that, be like, man, this is what the risen Lord has done. I'm telling you, it speaks more than your Facebook and Instagram posts of a photo booth of an Easter service. It will show the world a picture of a loving and a just God who went to the cross, put in the grave, but death could not hold him down. Sin could not hold him down. He is a risen king. And because he's risen, he calls us to come into relationship. He calls us to examine the truth claims. And then he says, I will work in you and through you. And the world will see, the dark world will see that there is a light that's still burning bright in his bride, his church. Would you please stand? We'll pray and we'll close. So this morning is a very special morning. I've been praying that this morning will be a spiritual milestone for some of you. Many times we stop at, I gave my life to Jesus, I was baptized, or I went to catechism, or I got confirmed in my church, and we stop at that. We stop at just coming to church. But from this morning, you see, Jesus is calling you into a closer intimacy with Him. Okay? And oftentimes, pastors just share the gospel and give the gospel call and invite people to give their life to Jesus. What I want to invite you to do is that, give your life to Jesus if you've never surrendered your life to Him. But I want to invite every single one of you who calls, claims to be a disciple of Jesus. 
I want to invite you to say, Lord, please give me the desire to dive deeper into knowing you. Although God revealed all of himself to man, we cannot exhaustively understand God in our lifetime and in all of eternity. But the more you begin to press into who Jesus is, he becomes more than a fascination. You begin to see that he is your lifeline. You will begin to see that he is all you need. You will begin to see that without Jesus, we truly can do nothing. You begin to see that, like he tells the disciples through the angels, tell the disciples to go to, to, go to Galilee, and I've already gone before them. You will not see that your Savior has already gone before you if you don't have a daily coming to Jesus, a daily wrestling with his word. And church, maybe this morning is your morning to repent from putting Jesus at the bottom of the list, not the main priority through whom the list is made in your life. Three words for the weary. Come, see, and then go and tell. Go and tell. Don't just go into the world the way you came, but go and let the world see the power of the risen king in you. And I've told you how you can get there. It's not a formula. It's not a philosophy. It's a genuine, authentic relationship with the risen king. So, Father, I pray that the lion from the tribe of Judah will be unleashed in our lives to roar and tear down the walls and to speak in and through us, O Lord. For those of us who have not experienced the power of the risen king in our day-to-day -day lives, I pray, O oh Lord, this morning that you will give us a desire to want to see your hands in our life and to press in towards that. I pray for those who are distracted with addictions, distracted with various different vices that we're trying to fix, behavior modification instead of a life transformation, trying to change our addictions instead of coming to Jesus and having an authentic relationship. You see, church, you can do as much as you can to quit your habits, but if you don't have Jesus, it doesn't profit you anything. If you don't have Jesus, it doesn't matter how faithful you are to your spouse. Really, it does not matter because being faithful to your spouse doesn't get you into the graces of God. At the same time, you might have been unfaithful you might have had a lot of hidden sin in your life. And I want to talk to you this morning. In fact, the Holy Spirit has an appointment with you this morning. You might be carrying a baggage from your past that is so big, but you've learned to hide it under your Christian facade. Stop that nonsense this morning. Give it all to Jesus. Come to Him. Come to Him. Investigate His claims this morning that says, Come to me all who are weary and I will give you rest. That's an absolute promise that he will keep. You've embraced an identity that is not you. You know that. He's calling you to come to him. Find your identity in him this morning. Don't come as a tourist. Maybe you came this morning just to come and sit back and to put up with an hour. But no, 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 no. He's calling you into a relationship. He's inviting you. I might not know your name, but he knows your name. There's an old song that says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And I'm telling you this morning, because he lives, he's inviting you to come. Because he lives, he's encouraging you to investigate him. Because he lives, he's empowering you to proclaim the risen Savior to the world with a sense of urgency. So Lord, come and have your way. Jesus, Come and glorify yourself in our lives at our expense, O oh Lord. Use us in any which way you please. Come and have your way. Come and have your way. Come and have your way, Lord. Come and have your way. Have your way in me. Have your way in your church. Have your way with your children. Have your way 
And Lord, if any time our physical fleshly desires get in the way, let your Holy Spirit stop us right there in our doubts, in our temptation, in our confusion with the voices from hell that we shouldn't be listening to. Come and stop us, O oh Lord, so that we'll focus on your truth that says, come, engage, and proclaim. I pray that today as we go back home, that we'll be rejoicing to proclaim the news that you are risen from the dead and you're alive, not just in Israel, not just in Galilee, but you're alive in our lives. And may the power of the risen Savior be seen through our lives. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 God bless you, church. God bless you. Good to see you, my friend. 